A recent comment on Final Fantasy forums has thrown into sharp, if rather comical focus, the ways in which Final Fantasy, and indeed wider game design principles, have changed over the last decade or so. This is something I've long been interested in. As a user experience UI design and systems designer, it's something I do as a profession, and it's something I tend to notice, uh, in particular in games where it's either been done uniquely or indeed badly, because good design, as they say, should be invisible. But the recent comment in question is about Final Fantasy VIII. It's on the Final Fantasy VIII Reddit page, and it was particularly amusing in how it crystallised this gulf between old and new Final Fantasy games, the changing player demographics perhaps, and the changing way game design mechanics are built and displayed. And just to explain what has happened in this case is the player in question has ventured into Balam Town at the beginning of Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, they've arrived at the harbour when they were required to go and find the fire cavern. They've then posted on the Reddit page asking for help because they were lost, they were stuck, they weren't sure what to do. Now, generally speaking, I think ripping on people online is a bit of a harsh thing to do. Uh, although I have to say some of the replies on this thread have been pretty funny. And for my part, I do wonder how this particular player is going to get on when it comes to the Tomb of the Unknown King, or indeed finding the White Seed ship later on in Final Fantasy VIII. But more broadly, what this particular comment does is it speaks to the broad shifts in gaming that have emerged over the past decade or so, the homogenization and the standardizing of certain patterns and systems that spoon feed or perhaps outright simplify the player experience almost to a point of pointlessness. In this case we have the adoption of wayfinding UI and accompanying mechanics that more often than not come in the form of map markers or highlighted goals on a map screen or, or on the heads-up display and these will literally demarcate where the player needs to go, uh, where they need to direct their avatar in order to complete a quest or progress the story, and they are very prevalent in latter-day Final Fantasy games such as Final Fantasy XV, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Rebirth, and so on. So this particular pattern of wayfinding has been around for quite a while. Uh, the first time I recall seeing it was in uh, Grand Theft Auto 3 back in 2001, and indeed Rockstar Games did bring a lot of innovations to bear on UI and HUD design with the advent of GTA 3 on the PlayStation 2. Final Fantasy X was also released the same year, and this also had a rudimentary map that marked the traversable area on a given sort of section, and also showed where save points were, for example. So this was the first time that we had a field screen map rather than an overworld map uh, in a Final Fantasy game. And around this period, we also had, for example, the Elder Scrolls games, which in their own way evolved the concept of traversal so in particular the, the fast travel mechanism, which went from this kind of diegetic in-game ability in Morrowind to something that could easily be achieved via the main map screen in later games such as Oblivion Skyrim, and many might argue contributed to the dumbing down of video game challenges in the modern era, in particular overworld traversal in the RPG genre. Now, for my part, I actually quite like uh, the Elder Scrolls approach. Uh, firstly, in Morrowind, it was amazing at the time. Uh, we had real challenge, not dissimilar from early Final Fantasy games, like the one in question, FF8, where you actually need to pay attention, you need to listen to NPC directions. Uh, so when they say things like head east to find a cave, not go west into town, uh, those things matter. Uh, the player can't just muddle through on this linear Railroad. In the case of Morrowind, which was a huge open game, you had to read signposts on the road, which was hard to do on these terrible graphics, but, but it was that sort of thing. It was really the onus was on the player to find the goal or location. Uh, later games, like Oblivion and Skyrim, sort of had a middle way where you could fast travel to locations, but only after you'd found them manually, or on foot for example, for the first time. And as for Final Fantasy games, there was no fast travel per se, but they were consciously designed to evolve and ease transit by having minified world maps rather than the one-to-one -one ratio of the Elder Scrolls. And chiefly, we had the evolution of modes of transport too, which progressed from chocobo or car 
up to the final form of transport, which was usually an airship. And that was actually a great way of locking off advanced or, or later stages of the game, certain cities, locations, that you could only access with, with better transport. So it's interesting to see how the advent of map markers and fast travel has changed this, because arguably the purpose of evolving transport in Final Fantasy games has been diminished. The value of talking to NPC characters at all has diminished. And taking Final Fantasy VII Rebirth as an example, the buggy is confined to the Corel region. It helps us access a couple of locations that aren't otherwise kind of obtainable, but there isn't really much else to it. Regarding the NPCs, the ones that have any sort of value in terms of initiating quests or whatever, uh, they are highlighted by map markers as well. And locations around the world map for side quests are highlighted with map markers too. And so the value of speaking to random characters in the world is arguably slightly more redundant today. And in the case of this player who got lost uh, and mentioned it on the Final Fantasy VIII forum, or players who get stuck in any of these older Final Fantasy games, generally if you speak to an NPC in a nearby town or village, they will reference something to do with the direction or the location of where you need to end up. You get these little nudges in the right direction as a form of problem solving, but again the, the onus is on the player. And beyond that, we have secret side quests and mini games, so in keeping with Final Fantasy VIII, things like the Balam Garden Card Club or the Shumi Village Statue, these things you can only discover through initiating conversations and having this incidental dialogue with an NPC, rather than glaringly obvious map markers saying, here's a quest for you, here's a mini game, here's a side quest. So it is a strange development in many action, adventure and RPG hybrid games today, it's one that I think not only potentially dumbs down games a little bit, but changes wholesale the way they are designed. Less effort needs to be put into the proportions of a world, or transport, or instructional NPC dialogue if everything is on display for you. And the only real requirement for the player is to unlock markers via the Remwave Towers in Final Fantasy, or vantage points in Assassin's Creed and that sort of thing to show you where to go. That being said, I think there has been some pushback uh, against this. I, I think this patterning will change in the years to come because I, I don't think it's sustainable for interesting and challenging game design. And there has been mounting criticism from audiences that, saying that it does take the effort out of games. And already some studios are finding novel ways to adapt or diminish these spoon-fed wayfinding elements, and my favourite in recent years has been uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, the way that they introduced a minimal UI, a minimal HUD, and they introduced the Divine Wind as this subtle wayfinding tool, rather than having map markers and, and routing and goals like displayed glaringly obviously to you. So genuinely interesting way to create wayfinding in Ghost of Tsushima and it also had some genuinely hidden game secrets on the map in the world uh, which I love. But as for Final Fantasy and Square today, uh, as we can see from Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth they've really dialed up the ease of use and accessibility of traversing Final Fantasy 7's world. There is no ambiguity or puzzling about where to go, what to do, and while yes on the one hand we could argue that this helps facilitate the flow of story, the continuous flow of story. I think it does create a certain deficit of challenge and lack of reward or even encouragement to interact with and explore the world at all. And actually, just to wrap up on this point, it reminds me a little bit of Metal Gear Solid and how Hideo Kojima sought to overcome the issue of players simply playing the game via the corner map uh, to see where guards were in Metal Gear Solid 1 and Metal Gear Solid 2, which made the game experience, if not simpler, then actually kind of stunted, because you had this beautiful graphics uh, for the time, and these environments and these character designs being ignored on the bulk of the screen in favour of the practicality of this tiny map in the corner that actually showed you how to avoid guards. So what we saw in Metal Gear Solid 3 and Metal Gear Solid 4 was an augmentation of things like camouflage, like environment design, like audio design, and all of these intrinsic game elements that were inside the game world to maintain the stealth and evasion aspect of the game, but in a much more challenging and ultimately enjoyable way, I think. 
Uh, and personally, I think Final Fantasy could take a leaf out of this book, uh, maybe go back to how they used to design a little bit more. And it's not a choice simply between a railroad of linearity that you can't get lost in, or a marker-pocked world full of, uh, of of all of these sort of side quests and whatever marked for you. Uh, but the augmentation of these open worlds through useful NPCs, useful transport, and instructive dialogue. So as for whether Square want to push the envelope by returning to these fundamental aspects of their early games, we'll just have to wait and see. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider joining me on Patreon. Alternatively, if you feel like donating me a coffee, you can do so. The links are available below.